Hello everybody, it's Peter, Peter with an I, S-T-E-W-A-R-T. Previously, when Nancy, Frank, and Joe got their first phone, they played around with it to make sure it called internationally. Also, it became known that Joe had a serious and potentially harmful problem with sleepwalking. So Nancy and Frank took advantage of it by playing a joke on him, by waking him up with Halloween masks. He was half sleeping, half awake, as if he was in a waking nightmare. <coughs> the joke was cruel and unkind, but it was pretty funny. Chapter 7 Hey, Joe. Did you have any dreams last night? Asked Nancy, sharing a chuckle with Frank as they ate their cereal. However horrible it was at the time, the nocturnal terrors from the night before seemed far behind him, washed clean with the onset of the good morning. Well, actually, I did. It was the strangest thing. I dreamt that monkeys from another dimension were chasing me. He recounted with a chill. Really, replied Frank, sharing a conspiratorial grin with Nancy. As he turned and toiled in a brown paper grocery sack, he asked, Did they look anything like... Frank whipped around with a horrible mask on. This! Joe stopped chewing as a shadow of fear came over him. What is this, I wonder, muttered Nancy to herself as she opened the envelope from the telephone company. Frank and Joe ran around to look over Nancy's shoulder. Joe shrank away from Frank, who still had the mask on. Take that mask off, Frank. You look stupid, said Joe, trying to hide the fact that it really scared him. Frank oogled through the latex. Amused at how Joe shriveled at the sight of it. He would have started to chase Joe around, but he wanted to see what Nancy was so interested in. It was a bill from the phone company. Oh, that ain't bad, shrugged Frank. He couldn't figure out why Nancy and Joe were in such shock. He presumed he had more foresight than his compadres, who evidently expected a much smaller bill. I knew it would come to about that much, he said. What? exclaimed Nancy. Joe was so dumbfounded, he couldn't even take his eyes off the piece of paper, which was more devastating than being given a broom tail. Forty-five dollars? I was expecting a lot more, he said, pleased with himself for his own erudition into the ways of the world amused with his friend's naivete. His smirk was snubbed when Nancy pointed out an article of importance. That's not a period after the 45. That's a comma. Nancy knew that from inside the mask, Frank's face was clouded with confusion. That means you're going to have to save your lunch money for 5,000 years. The reality of the situation was a crushing blow that made him physically weak. He hated school and wanted to graduate ASAP, but graduating meant he'd no longer have the allowance of one dollar for lunch, so he'd have to keep on going to school and keep on saving that dollar and starving through lunch for 5,000 years. He pictured himself walking around the cafeteria, mummified, holding his stomach in hunger, asking people, Are you going to eat that? What are we going to do? asked Nancy. Joe's mind was already frail from Frank bringing his nightmares to life. He shook his head. D do, do about what? he asked, looking far into nothing. The phone bill, wailed Nancy. Phone, bill, what's a phone, bill? I don't, I don't know, he said haltingly, shaking his head. Get a hold of yourself, 
said Nancy. His eyes appeared as if he had been looking into a mirror at close range for a long period of time, and when the mirror was removed, his eyes never focused back. Who, who are you? asked Joe, looking right through her. I don't even know who you are. I'm sitting on a beach in Hawaii, sipping cool drinks. Joe had lost it. Nancy turned to Frank for help, but Frank was deeply preoccupied. She could see his eyes through the mask, shifting as he mentally studied the plan mapped out inside his head. Mexico. I'll run away to Mexico. But they have schools and phones in Mexico, and they'll make me go to school there. I need to find a country that doesn't have schools or phones and go there. But how am I going to get there? He rambled. His planning was useless because there was no place he could hide. There were schools everywhere, and they worked together. Even if he moved to Antarctica, the only school-free zone, his own school wasn't afraid to extradite. It wasn't the schools Frank had to worry about as much as it was the phone company, whose monopoly encased the world in its sticky web. Historical note, kids, this is how it was before cell phones. 1984 was a year, a book, and a reality. Frank could run to the far reaches of the Earth and not get away. Even in the icy wasteland of Antarctica, the enormous bill would haunt him with a howling ring, ringing to be paid. Frank and his two co-conspirators thought they created the phone bill with their long-distance calls, but after looking through the printout, they soon discovered that the calls only accounted for approximately half the bill. The other half was for 1. the installation, the phone installer handing them the cord, and 2. hookup of their new line at the switchboards, which entailed an operator typing in Nancy's first name and Nancy's last name and pressing enter. Ordinarily, the general public would switch to a better phone company, but there is only one. There is no escape. Nice palm trees. So nice, mumbled Joe. Frank sat with the mask over his head, not moving except for an occasional twitch. What now? Are you two just going to lay in the cemetery waiting? said Nancy sarcastically. Frank and Joe considered the notion. Is it too far to walk? asked Frank. Maybe we could sail there on a catamaran, suggested Joe, whose mind was still somewhere off in the Pacific. Nancy got up. Where are you going? asked Frank. I'm going to make some strong coffee, she replied. We've got some serious planning to do. Thanks for watching today's presentation, and don't forget to look up my podcast. Doesn't cost anything. Search for Peter Stewart, and don't forget the eye.